Hey everyone, and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. For today's viewer request and presentation, we are turning our attention to the so-called Chinese Letter Series, a collector defined variant of the Type 56 carbine, which represents the production years of 1959 and 1960. As always, we're going to be going over a working definition, identification, historical context, collector considerations, and hopefully anything else you might want to know about these rifles. We aren't here to waste time today, so let's get right into it. At the most basic level, we need to have a working definition of what a so-called Chinese letter series Type 56 carbine is, so let's knock that out first. The variants we're describing today are military production Type 56 carbines produced at State Arsenal 296 in China during the years of 1959 and 1960. It's that simple. What's slightly less simple is identifying these things, so let's head that off next. Structurally, these things exhibit a distinct combination of mostly original Soviet SK-45 features with some early transitional Chinese elements. For example, they will have long barrel lugs, blade bayonets, one-piece gas tubes, lightning cut bolt carriers, and milled trigger guards, all consistent with Soviet construction. When observed from a distance, our only immediate clue that these rifles are in fact Chinese is going to be the stock. Most, but not all, Chinese letter series stocks will be made of catalpa wood, which is easily distinguished from Soviet birch or laminate. More obviously still, the Chinese letter series rifles will exhibit a left side sling swivel, a distinctly Chinese feature introduced in 1958. When we look a little closer, we find that the receiver markings are ultimately what define the so-called letter series. After all, the colloquial term letter series is in fact referring to the unique serialization scheme of these rifles, which incorporates a single Latin letter prefix followed by a four to five digit numerical sequence. Now, as a quick note, there do seem to be a few rifles in which the letter actually breaks up the five digit sequence. So in other words, it goes numeral, letter, four numerals, but these aren't super common. Another way to phrase this would be that all Chinese letter series rifles have a serial number, which includes a Latin letter followed by four numerals. However, some Chinese letter series rifles include a fifth number, and the location of that fifth number relative to that original sequence can vary. By the way, these Latin letters can be any letter in the English alphabet other than Q or Z for a total of 24 possibilities. Given that these 24 characters seem to represent 24 total months of production, there would seem to be a high probability that letters A through L indicate 1959 production, whereas letters M through Y represent 1960. However, I have never seen this confirmed in primary source documentation. We know with absolute certainty that these letters correspond to 1959 and 1960, but if there's information beyond that, I haven't seen it. Now, as an additional quick note, please remember that many U.S. importers added alphabetical prefixes and suffixes to Chinese rifles in order to comply with U.S. federal law, so we need to make sure that we don't let these markings confuse us. The simple presence of a letter in a Chinese SKS serial number does not inherently make it a letter series. We really need to make sure we're meeting all of the criteria I am going over here. Another extremely important feature of the markings on the so-called letter series is that we will have a triangle 26 marking denoting manufactured State Arsenal 296. However, we will not have a three character Chinese language marking establishing a type 56 model designation. Finally, particularly pedantic SKS enthusiasts, not unlike myself, may be interested to note that these rifles typically have much less Soviet style inspection and assembly marks than earlier production examples like the so-called ghosts. However, they often do have more than you might see on a mid 1960s or 1970s example. That said, understanding or recognizing these particular markings is almost never necessary from an identification perspective. In summary, when identifying a so-called letter series rifle, we are looking for an SKS pattern carbon in which the metal components conform to the late pattern Soviet SKS-45 design. However, the stock features the distinctly Chinese element of a side sling swivel. With these gross identifiers out of the way, our subtle confirmation elements come in the way of receiver markings, specifically a four to five digit numerical serial number with a Latin letter prefix. Finally, we need to see a triangle 26 marking, but no three character model designation. If your rifle fits all of these criteria, it's a so-called letter series. If it does not, something's wrong. The most immediate explanation, of course, is that it is not a letter series. However, there are a limited number of situations in which it could be a letter series, which has been re-arsenaled, commercially rebuilt, or otherwise separated from its original components and remarked. So now that we've established what these things are and how you can identify them, let's talk about the history that these rifles connect us to and exactly how they fit into the larger story of the Chinese Type 56 carbine. 
there are a few really important elements to this, so I'll try to weave everything together as coherently as I can. The first thing we need to understand when dealing with the letter series is that they are a transitional link, and therefore they can really only be appreciated when you consider them in the context of what came before them and what came after. With that in mind, I personally break Chinese SKS production into three distinct eras. I'm sure I'll expand on this distinction in future videos, but for now, those eras are early, middle, and late, which I might alternatively call the Sino-Soviet era, the Golden Era, and the Commercial Era. I consider the so-called letter series rifles to be the last production variant of the early or Sino-Soviet era. I define this era as the period of time in which Chinese SKS production was collaborative in nature. That is to say, it was a collaborative effort with the Soviet Union. I go into great detail on the earliest days of Chinese Type 56 carbine production in my video on the so-called ghost variant. And if you haven't seen that video or are otherwise familiar with that history, I highly recommend giving that a watch. I've got a link in the description of this video, which will jump you right to the section I'm talking about, which covers that history. As a greatly abbreviated summary, however, Chinese production of SKS pattern carbines was born out of a formal Soviet technology transfer, and the presence of Soviet advisors was so significant during the early days of production that even many of the indigenous Chinese workers were required to speak Russian. The very earliest Chinese production examples were essentially perfect clones of the late pattern Soviet SKS-45, and it took many years for the Chinese to take full control of production and develop the Type 56 carbine into the national icon that it would ultimately become. Therefore, it makes sense to me to distinguish between the early era, or the era best defined by Sino-Soviet collaboration, and the middle era, or the era best defined by complete nationalistic adoption of the platform. Once again, I consider the so-called letter series to be the final production variant of the early Sino-Soviet era. These rifles were made in 1959 and 1960, and 1961 saw a wide-reaching breakdown of political relations between the PRC and USSR, as well as, rather symbolically, the first appearance of Chinese language markings on the Type 56 carbine. One day I'll make a video which focuses just on that period, but for today we're looking at what came immediately before. With all that context in mind, we can now apply a new level of appreciation and understanding for exactly what makes the letter series rifles so unique, which is the presence of a letter in the serial number. Viewers of my ghost video will know that by the end of 1957, the Chinese had settled on a distinctly Chinese serialization scheme for the Type 56 carbine, which combined a representational date code with a production number. That system would ultimately be used for the vast majority of total production. What makes rifles made in 1959 and 1960 truly unique, however, is that for those two years, the Chinese temporarily backed away from this method. Now, I won't pretend like I have all the details, but I think that when we look at these rifles in context, a very likely narrative emerges. Block serialization using alphabetical prefixes, such as is seen on the letter rifles, is a distinctly European serialization method and was the dominant system used by the Soviet Union at this time. It's hard to imagine that the Chinese foray into this particular scheme was not Soviet-driven, or at least Soviet-influenced. The likely justification for this shift was that it does reduce the total number of characters which need to be stamped on the rifle. This might sound trivial to some, however, when we consider the ambitious scale of Chinese production and the fact that serial numbers are reproduced on multiple assemblies within a single rifle, we can appreciate that we're talking about eliminating tens of millions of stampings, and that's not insignificant. We also know that even after the Chinese reverted to their composite numerical serialization scheme, they would later drop a digit for this exact reason. So it seems reasonable enough that the Chinese could have been talked into that. Now, this still doesn't make perfect sense because even while experimenting with Russian style serialization, the Chinese didn't drop superfluous digits the way Russians would. For example, if the Russians were making a production number 39, they would only use two digits to mark this. So alphabetical prefix 39. The Chinese, on the other hand, seemed to make sure that all four digits were present, marking 39 as alphabetical prefix 0039, which is odd. This is a very Chinese thing to do. It's just a little odd to see if the whole point here, presumably, was to get rid of those superfluous digits. Whether or not my speculation as to Chinese motivations and influences here are correct, I think that this still points us towards a very likely conclusion, which is that regardless of the reason the Chinese made this switch, it didn't work out. Remember when I said that some Chinese letter series rifles have five digits and some of those five digit guns have a number which came before the letter? Once again, I am speculating here, but I think there is a really good chance that these inconsistencies are exactly what they appear to be. 
which are inconsistencies. That's the absolute last thing you want to have in a weapon serialization scheme, which is supposed to be orderly and predictable. That's the whole point. With all that in mind, I think that the most likely explanation here is that in 1959, the Russians talked the Chinese into adopting a Soviet-style serialization method, which for the first two years would consist of one alphabetical prefix and a four-digit numerical serial number, and for all future years would incorporate a second alphabetical prefix, just as the Russians would have done. For whatever reason, however, possibly due to decreasing Russian oversight, this serialization scheme just didn't make sense to the Chinese technicians, especially when production blocks exceeded 10,000 units. Mistakes were made and recognized. By 1961, the Soviet presence was likely all but non-existent, and rather than try to work out the bugs they had developed in Soviet-style serialization, the Chinese just reverted to the distinctly Chinese serialization scheme, which they had adopted in 1957 and that they knew worked. So there's another far more important part of this rifle story, and that has to do with what else was happening in China at the time that these rifles were made. It would behoove viewers to remember that although China is often credited as being the oldest continuous civilization on Earth, the communist experiment known as the People's Republic of China is rather young and was barely celebrating its 10th birthday at the time that these rifles were being made. Actually, celebrating is probably the wrong word to use because pretty much the one cross-cultural constant in human celebrations is food. And if there's one thing that was conspicuously absent from Chinese life in 1959, it was food. Now, please don't confuse my appreciation for irony and wordplay as trivialization. I did my time as a lower enlisted soldier in the U.S. Army, which if nothing else means that I will forever see the humor in dark situations. And this is about as dark of a situation as has ever cast its shadow on planet Earth. My favorite thing about collecting Curio and Relic firearms is that I find that they have the power to give a voice to the dead. And unfortunately, this rifle gives voice to tens of millions. So let's take a moment and listen to their story. In 1958, Mao Zedong, chairman of the CCP and supreme commander of the PLA, ordered a great leap forward, an ambitious social and economic reform package designed to propel war-torn and destitute China into industrial superpower status. The great leap forward was fundamentally structured in leftist political theory, specifically Leninist communism. Like most communist ventures, it promised utopia and delivered hell on earth. After all, if there is one value that leftists always manage to uphold, it is egalitarianism, as all mankind are made equal in suffering and death. The slogan of the Great Leap Forward era was, no need to play or eat, focus on producing. I think they were meant to be producing crops and steel, but due to the inhuman cruelty of Chinese policy during this time, the only meaningful product of the era was fertilizer in the form of decomposing bodies in the fields. In a horrifying display of leftist ecology in action, the Chinese people were mobilized to torture and kill approximately one billion sparrows under the infantile belief that this would preserve crops. It turns out that sparrows actually play a crucial and obvious role in maintaining the ecological balance, and in absence of this natural predator, Chinese croplands were overrun by biblical hordes of locusts, which destroyed far more crops than the sparrows ever could. The Chinese agricultural class, whose entire existence was defined by farming, a skill they had refined over countless generations, were prohibited from growing food in the way they knew how. Illiterate peasants and professional farmers were lectured in political theory at gunpoint and forced to employ unproven collectivist agrarian techniques designed by activists who hadn't spent a day of their lives nurturing life from the Chinese soil. Countless other skilled farmers were cut off from their professions entirely and forced to spend their days refining steel and backyard blast furnace made out of clay. When these concerned farmers explained to their local commissars that they could not feed their children steel, they were given assurances that the Communist Party would provide. I could go on all day here, but as you have no doubt already deduced, these policies resulted in a disaster of unprecedented proportions and what is almost surely the largest single cause loss of life in human history. The Great Leap Forward created the conditions for the Great Chinese Famine, and tens of millions of everyday Chinese people died of starvation, overwork, and summary execution. These were not warriors dying on the battlefield. These were not civilians caught in the crossfire. These were people from every walk of life. They were great-grandparents and they were newborn babies. They were shy students, hometown heroes, 
day laborers, and geniuses who would have changed the world if given the chance. This was whole families, whole towns, whole regional cultures that disappeared over the course of just a couple years. This is without a doubt one of the worst things that has ever happened. So why is all that relevant to us today? Well, because these Chinese letter rifles are a product of that era. These rifles were produced from 1959 through 1960, and the Great Chinese Famine ran its course from 1959 to 1961. Every ounce of steel that went into these rifles represents a worker whose promised rations never came. This rifle represents Chongqing, the home of State Arsenal 296, and a city which has produced more SKS pattern carbines, not just than any other city on Earth, but than any country on Earth. A city that lost 15% of its population during the years in which these rifles were produced. This weapon is a terrifying outlier in the world of material history. Most of the stories I tell on this channel can be reduced to something along the lines of war is really bad and we should avoid it. As deeply as it unsettles me, the story of this rifle is that war is not the worst thing that we are capable of. There is something profoundly dehumanizing about forcing starving people to harvest steel instead of food, and this rifle is a testament to that. Before we move on to collector considerations, I want to say one more thing, and it requires a disclaimer. I usually try to steer clear of politics on this channel due in no small part to the fact that I am not a political expert. Sure, I might have my opinions, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of complex issues facing the world, and I know that I'm missing a lot more of the picture than I am seeing. For that reason, I try to be respectful of people who see the world differently than me, I try not to take sides when I don't have to, and I try to sincerely be open-minded, even if sometimes it takes me a while to really chew things over. Generally speaking, as long as you don't tell me how to live my life, I'll be happy to call you a friend, and I don't really care who you voted for. That said, I'm still a student of history, and my highest aspiration on this channel is to give a voice to the dead. And this rifle teaches a political lesson that I feel obliged to double tap. In a sentence, communism is extremely dangerous. The devastation I just described was the result of a government body enacting communist policies without restriction. Anyone who says this wasn't real communism is either a child or an apologist for mass murder, because the historical record is very clear that Mao was a well-educated, true believer with absolute authority. He did not misunderstand communism. He was not pretending to be a communist in order to implement some other agenda, and he had no meaningful opposition. In fact, a huge part of the ultimate schism between China and the USSR is that Mao didn't think that Khrushchev was serious enough about ushering in the global socialist order that Lenin had prescribed. And Mao was. This was communism in action. When the lofty intellectual idealists finally caught their own tail, seized the means of production, and discovered that their prosaic conjecture wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, because at least that paper was technically edible. Again, whether you are a Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, my people killed your people, or vice versa, I come in peace. I'm an American. I'm not innocent. I cannot cast the first stone. All I can say is that when self-described socialist politicians talk about radical social and economic change in the 21st century, this is not the first time that such voices have been entertained. When far-left social commissars talk about forcibly repurposing institutions around the single focus of collective equality at the expense of individual rights, they've done this before. When Marxist academics, who have never once tried to wash transmission fluid out of their coveralls, propose the restructuring of critical industrial, agricultural, and ecological systems in alignment with their theoretical frameworks, they are not joking. There is nothing new about these people's worldview, and if given the opportunity, there is no reason to believe they would achieve a different result than have their predecessors. All right, Red Scare segment out of the way. Let's wrap this video up with some considerations for collectors. Not a lot to say here, but a few short things that I think are worth saying, so let's get through them. Should you buy one of these? Obviously, that's a personal choice. Depends what you're into. Coming from an SKS collector with a historical orientation, I do generally think that these are an appealing variant. As we mentioned earlier in this video, they do represent an interesting era in terms of the development of the Type 56 carbine, and I do personally consider them to fall in the early era of production, or the era best defined by Sino-Soviet collaboration. If you're building a Chinese Type 56 carbine collection, even a small collection, I imagine you might want an example from that era, and this one would fill that niche. 
If you were aiming for a larger collection, I think it's pretty much a given that at some point you would want a letter series, as it is one of the more recognizable variants overall. As for the more cultural history of this rifle, again, that's obviously a personal choice. I lean towards the perspective that a healthy society should absolutely be wallpapered with reminders of our past mistakes, lest we forget. I'm vehemently opposed to tearing down monuments and reminders from our past, whether literally or metaphorically, as my general opinion is that if we aren't looking at our history, we're going to be living our history. And while I'm personally prepared for either, I greatly prefer the former. In terms of the quality of these rifles, I think that one of the things which makes these rifles kind of scary is that the quality isn't typically any different from the rifles that came before or after. Despite being manufactured in the midst of an absolute disaster zone, if you close your eyes and handle one of these things, they aren't going to feel meaningfully different from a 1958 3 million gun or a 1961 6 million gun. It is also worth noting that they do mostly preserve that old world manufacturing feel, which is characteristic of the early production era. And that's another good reason why they can fill that niche. The last thing I'll say from a collector perspective is that like many Chinese SKS patterns, these are very rarely listed on auction sites in a way that would make sense to sincere and experienced SKS collectors. If you use search terms like 1959, 1960, or letter series, you probably will have limited results. Interestingly, the terms Sino-Soviet or 1956 are more likely to get you hits for this particular rifle or this particular variant of rifle, which is based in a long-standing but thoroughly debunked misconception as to the provenance of this variant. It's also not uncommon to see these rifles mistakenly listed as being Soviet SKS 45s, although given what Soviet SKS 45 prices have been doing over the past few years, listings like that are unlikely to have much appeal, as even the cheapest Russian guns still typically sell for the same price, if not higher, than some of the more collectible Chinese examples. As always, the best way to find collectible Chinese examples is to know what you're looking for and peruse a ton of vague national listings or local listings until you get lucky. And that's today's video, guys. As always, I hope you found it to be worth your time. If you did enjoy this video and wanna see more like it, I encourage you to check out my SKS playlist. There's a solid base of information on there and I'm adding to it all the time. If you wanna support my work on this channel, the easiest way to do so is to hit any combination of like, subscribe, or comment. That's what grows this channel and motivates me to keep going. Other than that, thank you so much for taking the time to check out this video, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.